I feel very lucky and fortunate to have grown up in the Western United States, in particular in the Western United States to have been born in Colorado because this kind of flora surrounded me from the moment I was born. And as a kid, I didn't understand it, but I knew it meant something. And then I found bonsai, but then you start to learn more and more about it and, and it's demystified. And you start to recognize there's really nowhere else in the world that has this in such abundance and a landscape so open and unbuilt to be able to be inspired by it. And now, if we saw a bonsai that looked like this, it would seem radical. But the more and more that I invest in these trees, the more and more it seems like there's nothing else to do but create trees like this. And that, that nuance is, um, is creeping into me slowly because I think there are, are much greater things to come from the medium of miniaturized trees and their capacity to drive forward a notion and an urgency to value these native landscapes and the sustainability of such. And I, I really think making bonsai on an individual level is pleasurable. It's insightful. It creates an awareness that I wouldn't have without the art form. On a public level, it's of the utmost importance to expose people to places that they might not go and realizations that they might not understand exist. There is so much to realize when opening ourselves up to experience the beauty and harshness within this complex world that we all share. That complexity is most apparent when we journey into the wild. On these journeys of discovery and realization, we're often drawn to connect with other life on Earth as much as we're drawn to connect with each other. When the stars align, those that we're connected to and a shared appreciation point to a way of life that we've not fully seen. Whether it be navigating around our feet or growing above our heads. Look at this thing. Unbelievable. Limber pine occur in these environments because of a symbiotic relationship with two animals. There's a, a bird and there's a marmot that take the cones of limber pine and distribute them on windy outcroppings. Because in the wintertime, when you get that wind blowing, it takes the snow off of those outcroppings and they have a food source in the deep, deep winter. So you see them in these radical conditions, not because that's where they want to grow, not because their seeds are dropped there, but because they're actually distributed by animals in those locations. If this were more soil, less rock, if this were higher moisture, if this were a different exposure, the Engelmann spruce, the subalpine fir, the lodgepole pine, they would grow in a grand stand that would far outpace the limber pine. 
in terms of growth rate and absolutely starve it out of light and resources and you wouldn't have limber pine up here. But this is where it's like, you know, it's pretty exposed, windy most of the time, it gets freaking cold, really hot, sun's intense, dry most of the time, sometimes we burn, but nobody messes with me up here. This is just, this is my spot. Wipe your feet off. Take your shoes off at the door. You immediately see the direction of the wind because the living tissue is on one side of the tree and it's on the protected side of the tree almost inevitably. And then this thing just gets freaking sandblasted. And the way limber pine breaks, it's just so uh, chunky flat breaks, but then you get this like long, delicate, really, really delicate wispy. How does that even exist out here? The rock shows as much of the wear as everything else. The way the rock's all pitted, that's super fascinating. You know, when you look at these pieces, they have their central leader, that tallest point, and that gets wiped out, and then all of these other pieces. Because when you look at a young limber pine, like an unfazed limber pine, it's a tall vertical tree. But then you see that as a dead spire and everything around it now takes over. Being sandblasted and eroded and ultraviolet rays causing complete and total bleaching and drying out of the tissue. Humidity's low, elevation's high, it's dry. There's no rot really up here. I mean, minimal amount, like almost perfectly preserved. Super duper radical. It's over here. Oh, wow. Okay. You gotta come see it from this side. That's a powerful one. That would be a hell of a hike. You know, give it a roll. Oh, this is gonna be worth it. The base is real stately, but the veins see the veins and then you see the deadwood but then this branch and you see it just, like, just drops down like it would die but then nope back up the journey continues it's hard to not be into ancient trees now to get out into the wild and to experience it and to find these little pockets of absolute gold is a very very personal thing to have you know to have for yourself to possess an experience and a memory is something nobody can ever take from you. And to get to share that with somebody, to share your little diamond, and to receive that gift from somebody else as well, and that being currency of friendship is so powerful when you both value something so intimate as the soul and life of a tree. <laughs>
Ancient tree. <laughs> Two thousand year old relic. Fancy that. You can actually see the branch still intact, but the trunk around it has deteriorated. It's like this fascinating dissection of vascular structure where the core has completely hollowed out, or this one where the inside of the trunk hollowed out, yet the branch structure is still in place. It's like you're seeing 2,000 years ago or 1,800 years ago. It's how this tree started. Water's moving here. You can follow those ridge lines and you see that intersection where this went right through it and this kept moving around it. Right, you can see it right here too. Boom. And then you see these pieces passing through it. It's fascinating. The collar. That is the collar that we always talk about in bonsai. And the branch collar. There, there's the branch. There's, there's the branch's connection to the vascular. It's freaking awesome. When we see nature's complexity through the eyes of someone deeply in love with it, <sighs> that same sense of wonder is equally felt. In this magical space, we get to discover and share what speaks to us in return. There are countless stories of life all around us to appreciate. The natural world often displays openly what it's been through. Survival, struggle, loss. With our companions close by, we can more easily recognize that our stories are also playing out. There is comfort in good company. It wasn't planned to ask Todd to come do this project with us, but it felt like to share this with somebody who would value it as much and maybe even carry it on in their own way it feels more and more important. We've supported each other a lot over the years, trials and tribulations of life, that common ground being bonsai, but then that really sort of turning into a tremendous friendship. I've never gotten the impression that Todd wanted anything more than to exchange friendship and knowledge about a common passion. I recognize that spending time with him makes me better at what I do. Being in the Rockies came on the tail end of having lost more bonsai in one single moment than I've lost in my entire career. It's never good timing to have a catastrophic heat wave, but there's always a good time to come to the mountains. You know, and I left that situation and I flew into what I would consider to be paradise on Earth. Starting in the Limber Pine Grove with that western-facing arid hillside, and ending up on that east facing, at least at the time that we were there, far more friendly environment of the bristle cones. Seeing the funnel of that wind and how it had completely and totally not just eroded the living tissue of the trees and created a wind blown aesthetic, but how it had toppled trees, how it had leveled the landscape. Like it looks like somebody just everything just flattened this. The gale force winds, hurricane force winds hit this thing just boom. When I think about the Rocky Mountains, this is everything that I think about. It's really quite powerful. It just doesn't get any better. It's like a museum.
This would be an unpleasant place to be in the middle of it. It'd feel like the earth was trying to take you out. Mother Nature is unforgiving and unrelenting and also so incredibly generous at the same time. And that's really a tough conundrum to work out in my head. It doesn't feel uh, like a luxury, it feels like a necessity to try and grab hold of a lot of this. How to feel accepting as well as so vulnerable and in danger at the same time with Mother Nature? It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. <laughs> it is one of the great relationships of respect that we as human beings are probably going to need to learn to appreciate more and more because Mother Nature is, um, I think, showing her extremes. We show up at a location, we see things. We're not catching that location on the harshest of days. We're not seeing every influence that exists there. But then you have the tree that is a continual presence. And the more prolonged that presence, the more that that tree communicates what happens in that space, that landmass, and the elements that are acting on those trees from elevation, from wind, from snow, from drought, from heat. The tree is just responsive to that. It's just taking that, it's absorbing that. It's not making choices, it's in reactivity that a portion of the tree is lost and now its next story or next chapter begins in terms of adapting to its new condition that it didn't plan but unforeseen circumstances have created for it. And to see that story written over the course of time in the tree is the translation. It, it is the communication and it's just so incredible to be able to read a 2,000 year old book. There is definitely an undeniable component of bonsai, which is the human element and the camaraderie that comes with that common ground. But then when you mix that with the camaraderie that comes with being in the native environment, which is a higher degree of camaraderie because you start to depend on each other more, having those two things dovetail together was something that I was not aware of. Um, and the power of that I was not aware of. And the love that I felt when we were finished with that project was something that I have never experienced before. The unique part of doing this project with Todd was that I was very aware of his presence. I wasn't spending a lot of time thinking about what's Todd doing? What's, does he like it out here? Does, I wasn't spending any like energy thinking that, but I was, I was aware that he was there, and that was more like calming and felt a lot more wholesome than anything else. And I was very excited to see what his experience was like through the work that he did. You know, because I know what it's like for me. But I didn't know how that would translate for him. 
Does it have that same sort of groundbreaking shift of perspective in the bones I form for you know somebody whose opinion and impression I value? And and it did. After having suffered tremendous loss. All of that loss was forgotten, and I was just there, you know, with Todd in that moment. Just being present. In the moment, free of a lot of the concerns that come with life. I mean, you can't find a greater therapy. You can't find a greater way to achieve peace of mind. Many of us go into the wild to find peace of mind. We seek comfort by disconnecting from our everyday life. But what if our everyday life, including those around us, were the source of that peace? What happens if we share and amplify that peace with one another? look at somebody and you know that you've both been a part of something special and experienced the same thing, that recognition is profound. That look carries a thousand words with it. Unity is a powerful thing. Feeling understood is a powerful thing. And getting to share is a powerful thing. And when all of those things happen at once, there's not much more that needs to be said. The trees that survived, especially on Windy Ridge, survived in community. They did not survive standing alone. The alleyways of wind and the groupings of trees that together created a really aerodynamic funneling of the wind's forces that they could withstand together was like, wow. It was just really strong. It was a really strong metaphorical thing to see and experience. Mother Nature, when she wants to go ahead and make a point, Human-built protection and comforts don't stand a chance, and it's like, do we have the capacity on an individual level and on a community level to be able to band together and endure these powerful forces? And that's a growing question. Exploring nature can bring us to realizations that, when shared, bring us closer together. With what is facing us currently, being closer together is what is needed most. The wild world is always there for us to explore together and learn from. <laughs>